Amen. Amen. Church, take your Bible this morning, please, and open it with me to the book of Psalms. Psalm 99, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to preach today on our holy God. And Lord willing, if Jesus tarries and gives us opportunity next Sunday, we'll preach on a, a holy people. This morning, stand with me if you would. Psalm 99, we're going to uh, read verses 1 through 3. And I don't see a back monitor guy. Oh, I don't see it anywhere. Jonathan is uh, out today, and we're going to be patient with his stand-in <laughs> for a second anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, you read along as I read out loud. We won't read aloud together. But uh, we'll be in the same place. Psalm 99, beginning in verse 1. The Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. Let the people tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and He is high above all the peoples. Let them praise Your great and awesome and holy name. Look at verse 5. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at His footstool. He is holy. Verse 9, exalt the Lord our God and worship at His holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Let's pray. Father, today we are so humbled at the, a passing thought of Your holiness. And Father, to stop and to meditate on it, it's just almost too much. God, we pray for Your grace to preach, Your grace to hear. And Lord, the wisdom to understand what it means that you're a holy God. Father, I pray that you would forgive the sin of the irreverence of your people towards your holiness. Whether it's your name flippantly used, Lord, whether it's your worship flippantly missed, Lord, whether it's your holy character where we sin flippantly. Lord, today, be our teacher. Spirit of God, transform us in the power of holiness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you and be seated. I had in my mind the idea of saying, uh, fill out, finish this sentence. God is, and leave it blank, then he don't tell me we're going to be singing about holiness for 20, 30 minutes, and we're going to be talking about holiness, read scripture about holiness. If you didn't put holy in that blank, if I said that, then you might be just too dumb to find the car. <laughs> no. But if you just walked into a study somewhere, and somebody got up and said, hey, on your paper, finish this statement, God is. Uh, we, we know that holy might not be the most used answer. Stuff like love, merciful, gracious, uh, those things are, are made much of. And yet, we're going to see today that uh, God's primary name for Himself in Scripture is holy. In fact, holiness is not basically an attribute. It's more of an adjective that describes every other attribute of God. You see, I think we like love because we don't use the word holy love. We just use love. And then however I define love, I can attribute that to God. And somehow that makes it okay. I can think about forgiveness and not add holy forgiveness. And I can add my definition of forgiveness and I can operate in that. You see, holiness, we're going to see, is that that defines every other aspect of God and His other attributes. God is loving. God is a Whole, loves with a holy love. Well, keep your Bible handy. I want us to look at some passages this morning. But first of all, if, if you want to fill in the outline, Ryan, go on to the next one. I want to talk about the standard. That holiness is the standard by which God exists. That holiness is the standard by which God operates and by which God functions. Years ago now, I, I uh, heard a man preaching and uh, going to school in Alabama. There's oftentimes words I hear I didn't understand. And the guy talked about the obduracy of God. 
the obduracy of God against sin. And I thought, well, if God's against sin, there's got to be a good word. I went home and looked it up. And obduracy is a stubborn refusal to change your action or change your attitude. God is obdurate when it comes to sin. God is holy God. He will never be less than holy God. In a million centuries, he'll never be less than holy God. He's not going to change that for me. He's not going to change that for you. Listen, he didn't even change it for his own son. God's standard is that of holiness. We see that as God refers to, number one, his person. In Isaiah alone, over 30 times, God refers to himself as holy God or the holy one of Israel. Now, I, I want to kind of take a pause yet before we jump deeper. I, I believe this is such an important issue because today there is such a flippancy among uh, people about who God is and about what it means to be his child. I mean, my word, we're, we're hearing denominations barely, barely hang on to what God calls an abomination as a sin with their voting on whether or not they're going to move that aside or not. You know what? I don't care how many votes we take. I don't care how many million people stand behind it. God will never in His holiness say what is sin is right or what's right is sinful. It is contrary to everything He is in His nature in his nature God's holiness in his person we saw in the passage that we read four times God says I'm holy in Leviticus chapter 11 verse 44 and 45 God says for I am the Lord your God you shall therefore consecrate yourselves and you shall be holy for I am holy now we're going to see next week how God's holiness impacts us if God's holiness is not impacting you there's an obvious why question to be answered. You shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourself with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. In Ezekiel 39, verse 7, God said, so I will make my holy name known. I love that song. I just caught that word. We, we've sung it before. It was the word we sang. It, the, the word just hit me. And it's so beautiful. Holy is the Lord's renown. It's his renown. That's his reputation. That's how he's known. That's who he is. Holiness is his renown. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful. God said through Ezekiel, I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. God says, I am holy God. God's not hid that fact. He's not playing, playing hide and go seek with His holiness. His creation declares His holiness. I was thinking about it earlier. We, th we talk about the creation of earth that we get to see with the eye. And I, then I remember uh, the, the, that our galaxy is one of the smallest of the multitudes of galaxies, that there is galaxies upon galaxies. And I want somebody to say, well, why in the world would it be all those galaxies? Because you couldn't make enough galaxies to contain or express the glory of the holiness of God. Take them all, and it won't do it. Jesus, in his model prayer, when the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, he said, pray like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I heard it said years ago, and it bears repeating today, and men, women, we need to take the caution. God may be your heavenly Father, but he's not your old man. He's not the man upstairs. He's not the, the uh, unknown power. He's holy God. And His name has been revealed and made known. And His holiness has been seen from the cross and every other way that God's expressed it. He's holy God. That's who He is. That's the standard. And we see it in His name of His person. Jesus in His high priestly prayer said, Lord, now I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. And Jesus prayed prayed to the Father, he acknowledged him, you're holy Father. You see, it just amazes me at how God refused to be anything less than holy. On that day when Christ hung on the cross between heaven and earth as though he belonged to neither, 
He hung there as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the earth. And there came that moment when the sin of all mankind of all time, past, present, and future, all of the sin of humanity was poured on him. His father didn't stay close, pat his hand and say, Oh, hang in there, son. Sunday's coming. He's holy God. And when our sin was placed on Christ, for the only time in eternity, the unity and harmony of the Trinity was broken over our sin because of the obduracy of holy God. When sin fell on His own Son, He turned His back. And Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? And He knew why. He's holy. That's why. And you think God's going to play games with our sin? You think God is going to just blink and wink at our sin, do like our mamas and our granddaddies? Now, if you do it again, I'm going to have to spank you. Now, if you do it again, now I've told you three times, but if you do it again, all right, I mean it this time. God's a holy God, and we got an earth full of Christian people who play with sin like it's a, a puppy, warm and cuddly, cute. It's cute. Ain't that funny? Ha, ha, ha. And the holy God in heaven is looking at our sin and saying, What are you doing? Why do you think my son died? Why do you think I turned my back on him when he became sin for you? Because I am holy God. And to think less of me is a great and grievous error and mistake for his children to make. Peter quoted Leviticus, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all manner of conduct. Well, let's move from the person. I want, let's talk about some of the pictures of holiness. Uh, all through the Scripture, we see pictures. We see things God is doing in a way that He's doing that gives a picture of His holiness. Uh, the, one of the first pictures you come to in the Old Testament is when God it tells Moses in Exodus chapter 19, you set out boundaries for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely die. God, holy God, is going to visit the mountain there, and he says, Look, don't, don't let them, there's boundaries. Why? Because if sinful man gets to me, death is the only thing that can happen. He told Adam, who created in his holiness, When you sin, you will surely die. And he did. God's holiness says there is a separation between me and sin now and forever. Jesus tells the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man lifts up his eye in hell, and he says, let Lazarus come and just dip some water and just touch my tongue. And what does Jesus say? No, no, no. Between you and him, there is a great chasm that is fixed. John 3 says, if you're, not, if, you don't, if you're not born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Much less later, if you're not born again, you can't enter it. You can't lay eyes on it. Those in hell, they're not watching heaven and seeing what's going on. They can't even see the glory of the holiness of God. They can't even see it. The boundaries that are set. Beautiful picture of the divisions in the tabernacle. There was the holy place, but then... There was a holy of holies. There was a veil, a thick veil, a thick veil between the holy place and the holy of holies. You had a special priesthood. You had a special priest because of the holiness of God. He could only go in behind the veil on one day, the day of atonement for the sin of God's people. He could only go in that one day, and he went in only he. Any other body run in and check a place out? Let's go for a tour. Dead. I've told you before, they tied a rope to the foot of the high priest. They put bells, sewed bells into the hem of his garment. They wanted to be able to hear him moving around and doing his work. And if he died in there, who's going to go get him? They had the rope. They'd retrieve him out. Why? Because God has set a boundary, and you don't come past here except the one who I've certified and I've signified, and he comes one way with the blood of sacrifice for the sin of his people. We see pictures, the special offering, the special feast days. All of those are pictures of God's holiness. The tithe that we just gave a moment ago, every Sunday when I write that check and I hold it in my hand, I have a picture 
of the holiness of God. God has said, this I have set apart, I have designated, I have claimed it. It's mine. It's holy unto me, unto him, God. It's his. We get to, we get to acknowledge in the pictures of the word of God, the holiness of God. But that brings us to an understanding that because of God's holiness and God's set obduracy to sin, that no sin has ever or never will be in His presence. It leads us to the second thought of separation. Separation. Because of the holiness of God, God is separated from sinful people because sinful man and holy God are incompatible. We see, number one, that redemption is required. Now, listen. Ephesians 5, verse 6 through 8. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon sons of disobedience. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. One time, we were separated from God because of our sin. To, to, to understand that the holiness of God is what required redemption. And why redemption could only be through Christ Jesus, the sinless sacrifice. This idea that there's got to be thousands of ways to, to God shout out the fact that they don't have a clue about the holiness of God. Any other way than the blood of Christ is some kind of effort, some kind of work yourself there, some kind of make yourself holy, make yourself acceptable, make yourself right. That was the great tragedy of Israel. The Apostle Paul, turn over to Romans chapter 10. Look at it real quick. That was Paul's great prayer and his great heartbreak for Israel. Listen to what he says, Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear witness, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. God is a holy God. There is a separation between God and sinful man. Think about it for a moment. It's not just that sinful man is separated from God. Listen to me. It's God is separated from sinful man. We're going to see in a moment, James talks about adulterers and adulterers. Do you not know that enmity with the world, uh, uh, that uh, friendship with the world is enmity with God? Do you realize that we are born of the flesh, born of a sinful heritage of a sinful lineage born in a sinful world over which satan is a prince and power of this air we are a sinful people and we are forever the, at enmity we are the enemy of god before we come to christ it wasn't that we were neutral that we just we just you know I, you know i just let god do his thing and i did my look it, you you can't get a more vehement picture that the word enmity the word enmity that we were against god but more than that, God is against us in our sin. Not against us in His desire to know Him, but to know Him only one way, holiness. Only one way, holiness could be met. And it was the way of the cross. That's why Jesus said, not in arrogance, but in integrity and honesty. There's no way, no, every man must come to the, there's no way to the Father but by me. Holiness demanded it. And redemption met the holy demand of God. On that day, when Christ hung there for us, God poured out on him everything holiness demanded whew, against sin. Everything that holiness demanded, Christ bore for us. And by him, by him, only by him. So, in that separation from God as sinners. Well, let's talk for a moment about after we become a Christian. Let's talk about the saint for a moment. What, a, what an unbelievable privilege is ours. That in Christ Jesus, we're called the saints, the beloved. The word sanctify. What does sanctify mean? It means make it holy. When something is sanctified, it's made holy. That God has sanctified us in the blood of His Son. 
that we've been made right before God. A young man in our, in our area posted years ago about God is holy and he must send every sin to hell. Every sin. If you leave your sin on your account, you got to go. But if you allow the righteousness of Christ to be yours and you place your sin on Christ, they're atoned, they're paid for, and you are sanctified. But I just wanted to, we're going to talk a lot more about it next Sunday. But, but I just want to talk about, though, what should that mean for us in terms of reverence, in terms of respect? Now, I, I don't want to get the idea. I mean, God, we know that God is an eminent God. But in His holiness, God is a transcendent God. We sang it in the song, Holy, Holy, Holy. Only thou art holy. There's none beside thee. <laughs> none other. And if you raise them all as high as you can get them, none of them are going to be beside God. Nobody else is holy. But when it comes to God's people, when it comes to our hearts, God says to us, my ways are above your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And yet in Christ Jesus, Paul says, we have the mind of Christ. In Christ Jesus, Paul says that we can let the same mind be in us that was also in Christ Jesus. We can think on heaven wavelengths because of redemption. That required it. But to have enmity, to have friendship with the world is to have enmity with God. And to take sin lightly and to toy about it. Now, I know there's extremes, right? There's this extreme where uh, not only do we take God serious, we take ourselves so seriously we can't joke or, or, or have any kind of humility about ourselves. I've always said to staff, I've always said to preacher boys, I'm going to say it in, in Africa, we can't take God too seriously. But we can take ourselves too seriously. I'm not God. I don't even want you to think for a moment I am. Not for a moment I am. There's the other, on the other hand, where God is our buddy, buddy chum. God's our pal. Me and God, we'd be mates. The line said, we have no problem using his name in moments of frustration, in moments of disappointment, moments of anger. We just throw his name out in vanity. Pro the opposite of holy is profane or common. His name is holy. And to throw that name about, to banner it about, in a profane way, in a common way, shows a lack somewhere, a breakdown somewhere between my thinking of who God is and His holiness and how I'm using His name. So somewhere between that buddy-buddy, the man upstairs, the power, can't even think of that phrase. Somebody help me. Higher power, that's what it is. Now, I have no problem. I, I, I thank God for 12-step programs that help people get out of addictions. But as a believer and as a Christian who reads my Bible, this higher power has given his name. This higher power has made himself known. His name is God. He sent his son Jesus to give you the enabling and the ability to get free from every sin that besets you. Well, Think about it. When Peter says to those of us who have accepted Christ as Savior and Lord of our life, think about this. When he says, you have become partakers of his divine nature. Whew. You have become partakers of his divine nature. Now that don't mean I'm holy like God's holy. That means I took my thimble down and dipped it in the ocean of his holiness. And I possess it. Because the Spirit of God in me is a Holy Spirit. And I become a partaker of His divine nature. Not that I'm God, but that God has sanctified me and set me apart by the blood of the Holy Lamb to holiness of who He is and His attributes are. 
That's why I'm to love in a holy love. That's why I'm to have mercy with holy mercy. That's why I'm to forgive with a holy forgiveness. That's why I'm to serve with a holy service. Everything we do ought to have that adjective of defining holiness in front of it. When you see why the angelic host sing in His presence continually. Holy, 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 thrice holy. Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy. One holy essence. Three persons of the holiness. That is God. Holy God. Well, all of that leads us to number three. The word substitute. We need a substitute. Because God is holy and we're born in sin, what does it mean? It means I must approach God. Listen, I must approach God on the merits of another. There's not any way I get to stroll into God proud and arrogant and say I'm here on my merits. I couldn't even see Him on my merits much less enter His presence on my merits. But we come to God, holy God, on the merits of another. God said, you will never get here. You will never make it. I, I love the old song. Still do. Don't hear it much. Love the old song. I owed a debt I couldn't pay. Or he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. All day long, Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. Not because I wouldn't have had time, took too much. There's no way possible sinful man could have ever approached God on our own merits. But in his substitution, we took our sin for himself, personally. We took his sin for us. Because sinful man and holy God are incompatible, redemption is required. The wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. For you were once darkness, but now you are light. Lord, walk as children of the light. The only thing that comes on sin is wrath. But Tony, you just said we're sin. God forgive our sin. He does. We're going to talk next week about that. There is a positional and there is a personal or practical we're going to talk about it but the person who is made holy by the blood of the holy sacrifice by the holy lamb who then thinks somehow that is some kind of pass or get out of jail free card to sin is totally deceived and dangerously foolish when the bible warns there is a sin unto death there is a sin unto death for the people of God. Paul talked about it in Corinth when he said, there's those who came to the Lord's Supper, one of the holiest of pictures of the two God gave the church for us to look at from time to time. And they treated it in a profane way. They made it some kind of, some kind of gluttony, some kind of drunkenness. Paul says, for that reason, some of you die. He used the word sleep. It's the word for death. Why? Because God is a holy God. And who in the world do we think we are to flippantly respond to His holy person in some lackadaisical, funny way that sin in any way could be puppy dog cute or funny? The purpose of redemption, but then the person of redemption. Only Jesus could accomplish it. It's one of my favorite verses as I quoted it in a gathering on Tuesday. For God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You hear that? I didn't make myself righteous. That we might be made by God through the blood of Christ. We, through him, might be made righteous. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God through him holy God holy God well 
I want us to close. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. There's some, about four verses there I want us to look at as we get ready to give an invitation. So what's the practical application? Well, look first, if you will, at verse 14. The writer of Hebrews says, it's there on the, on the board. We can, you can read it with me there. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You see that? Could that be any clearer? Without holiness, no one will ever see God. So what does that mean? If you're not willing to be made holy by the blood of Christ, I don't care how moral you try to be. I don't care how ethical you try to operate. I don't care how, how many thousands upon thousands of good deeds you might try to heap up to somehow hide and cover the sinfulness that is you. It will never work. Without the holiness of God, no one will ever see the Lord. So what does that mean? That means I must be willing, not be zealous for some righteousness I concoct in my own definition and in my own ways. I must be able to see, as Israel must have had to see, that I can't be made holy, that Christ is the end of all of that, of trying to work to be holy. You can't do it, but to come to Christ, humble ourselves before Him, and ask Him to forgive us of our sin, place our sin on Him, allow the Spirit of God to come in and place His righteousness on us, and be made holy, and be made sanctified, so that we might see God, because of what He's done, because of what He's done on our behalf and for us. But what about those of us that are Christians? Look with me at verse 10, would you? It's in the context of chastening or discipline. We're going to look at it a little more probably next week. The writer says, For they indeed, for speaking of our earthly fathers who chastened us, which by the way is a spanking, if you're again it, I don't know why. Verse 10, For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Do you hear that? God says, even in chastening, even in my discipline for you, when you as my child gets out of, out of, out of bounds and you're living in sin and you're deceived and, 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 you're, and you're living in ungodly way, even my discipline is for the purpose of restoring your holiness. I want to move you back to the place of holiness where I've saved you and transported you and placed you to live and move and have your being. Even in chastening, the purpose it's not punishment. It's holiness. Holiness. Look down to verse 28 and verse 29, please. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably, acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. I believe today, the church in America especially, we need an old-time revival of holiness. Not that erroneous doctrine that somehow we can reach sinless perfection. There's nothing about that in the Word of God. Couldn't anything be clear that that doesn't exist on this earth. There is a sinless perfection awaiting us. It's the promise of God that we will operate in, that one day I'll have no sin nature. I'll have no downward drag of the flesh. And all of that is put away, and I am glorified as well as sanctified and justified. I am glorified, and I live with Him in a holy, holy existence. Oh, glory to God. Come, Lord Jesus, come. One day. But how should we live? Acceptable. Serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. That we respect God. I didn't fear my daddy. I didn't fear my daddy. But I feared my daddy's wrath. And his wrath wasn't always reasonable, but if he wasn't in wrath, I didn't fear him. But in wrath, I had a reverence and a fear for my daddy's wrath. A Christian who gets into sin or who just looks at sin in a casual way, what you're saying is, I have no fear for the reverence and all of the holiness, the holiness of who God is. 
God's holiness has been met with holy love and holy grace. The psalmist, I think, says it is something on the lines of holiness and grace have kissed. Isn't that beautiful? God said, I'm holy, and because you're sinful, if I only had holiness, there ain't no hope on earth for you. But I have holy love. It says, I make a way in grace to make you who are unacceptable, acceptable. How? By reducing my holiness, no, but by elevating you and making you holy. Glory to God. Glory to God. Holy. Today, we need, I say, a revival of holiness. And one of the great awakenings said that Jonathan Edwards stood in his pulpit there in the north. That podium built up high and he climbed up those steps and he read his sermons word after word, page after page, and he turned them. No extemporaneous preaching. He read his sermons, but he preached on the holiness of God. And all of a sudden the Spirit of God fell. And the people began to weep before God. People on the sidewalks walking by began to be encountered with the holiness of God and knelt on the sidewalk and began to cry out for mercy before God. It went all the way down to the docks and the bowries and men fell down under the conviction of the holiness of God. Why today is there no conviction? I say maybe, possibly because among the people of God there is no awe or reverence of holy God. If we don't revere Him as holy. Who in the world will? We know Him. We know His name. And His name is holy. That's who He is. Oh, that God may give us a holy, holy reverence for Him. And may God give us His obduracy towards sin. That I hate it. I hate my sin. Why? Because holy God hates it. Six things God hates, yea, seven are an abomination. And he lists them off. And they're sinful actions of God's people. God hates sin. He loves sinners enough to send his son and even to turn his back on his son when our sin was placed on him. God, give us a set of duracy for sin. I wouldn't excuse it. Well, you know, nobody can be perfect. Look, we don't need any more proof text on that. That's pretty well settled down the centuries. We don't need any more proof text coming from us on that truth. What we need are some proof texts that say, I was not bought with silver and gold or precious stone. I was bought with the blood of the Lamb without spot and without blemish. And God took my sin. He took me a sinner. And He sanctified me. He made me holy. And to act any other way is a denial and a lie against His grace, His holy grace, His holy love, and His holy mercy, and His holy forgiveness. And I fear him too much to do that knowingly or flippantly, much less willingly. Let's pray about it, could we? Father, this morning, we need to respond. We need to respond to what the Holy Spirit is identifying in us, what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. Father, I pray for the one today who doesn't know you as Savior and Lord, and maybe with the best of intentions, they're zealous for their righteousness. God, they're trying to get to heaven their way. They're convinced. Maybe Daddy told them it was the right way. Maybe Daddy told them it was okay. Granddaddy said it was all right. And because of the moral outcome, they're comfortable with it. They're comfortable in it. And yet their own sin has never been atoned. Their sin has never been forgiven because they've never made Jesus Lord and Savior of their life. And today I pray your holiness would burn through the fog of all self-efforts to be made right. 
and that in just a moment we would come and bring our sin to the foot of the cross and kneel here and let him who was made sin be sin for us. That we might receive his righteousness and be made righteous and might be acceptable on the basis of the merit of another, only the Lord Jesus. Father, I pray that we as your people, Lord, that me as pastor and we as people be touched and moved today deeply by the reminder of who you are. Your great name is great and awesome because it's holy. Holy is who you are. Holy is who we want to be. Father, maybe there are those who are in attendance who've never become covenant members, but today it's their desire to be around those whose goal is to walk in the holiness of another. The holiness of Christ would be our standard. That our encouragement to one another would be that of holiness. That our provoking of one another would be to the good work of an obduracy towards sin. Father, in this moment of response, may every heart, every heart in the sound of my voice give you the response that demonstrates a conviction that you are indeed holy and deserve from us a holy response. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you stand?